Morning, church. You know, I got to say, Mason, you did a great job with that scripture reading, man. Fantastic. Let's give him a round of applause for that, huh? Hey, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and, and talk to people and, and do scripture readings like that. And church, we, we've got a choice. We can either disciple our kids or we can let the world disciple them for us. Speaking of that, I found a post. Um, I should say I was made aware of a post on Reddit. If you don't know what Reddit is, uh, it builds itself as kind of the front page of the internet. Uh, kind of a, you know, you, anybody can get on there, you can make a username, you know, you don't, it's not, nobody, it's, it can be anonymous, you can post whatever you want, put whatever you want. A lot of people go to it to ask advice, to ask for help, and that's what this one post is all about. So I'm going to read it. Now I've cleaned it up as, uh, as best I can, uh, but understand the nature of what it's talking about, there's only so much that can be done. But I think it's important that we hear what this individual has to say. So this is a mother posting about uh, asking for advice for her son, her transgender son. Post title, I have no clue what to do. My daughter can't get the bottom surgery and is becoming suicidal. Hello, I've always been in support of my transgender daughter, this is her son she's speaking about. When she still was a boy and started expressing a want to be a girl, I did everything right. Therapists, puberty blockers, everything. Now she is 20 and everything is falling apart. We had to hold off on the surgery because of costs, but now finally have enough and went and got several consult, consults. All have said the same thing. The puberty blockers have deformed this woman's son. There's nothing they can do. Obviously, my daughter is now distraught. She is in counseling, but is becoming worse and worse in her mental state. And I'm frantic. On top of this, she has never had any type of normal, healthy function. And you parents, you know what I'm talking about there. No urges, no desires, none that she can, he, can even stimulate for himself. Nothing. The doctors say this probably won't change even after the surgery. His dating life, her dating life, as she has it written here, is dismal as well. We knew it would be hard, but it's impossible. The one man who was with her for a while soon just became frustrated and broke it off. I don't know what to do. A friend suggested I post here for advice. Please help me help my child.
we hear me now? All right, we're back. It's easy, church, to hear about this culture, to hear about these failings in our society, and to get angry. Looking through that post, it's outrageous. This poor man, this poor son, this poor child was betrayed by his mother. Not because the mother is wicked or evil or indifferent. The mother is a victim of the world as well, believing lies that are readily told. She believed the lies that are told and encouraged by our own government. Because I challenge you, I challenge you to go look at the CDC website. I challenge you to go look and read for yourself what it says should be the treatment for gender dysphoria. Because I'll tell you right now that that mother followed that treatment regimen to the letter. And look at what's occurred. Church, it's evil in the face of great wickedness and in the face of great evil to be outraged, to be angry, to be frustrated, to go after those who would perpetuate such things. It's easy, church. But I remind you what James told the church. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not accomplish, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. While it's easy to be angry, church, this morning we're going to examine the response we should have to the evils of the world, to evils like this one, to this mother and other victims like her through our continuing study of the supremacy of Christ in Colossians chapter 1, so that as sons and daughters of the Most High, we are all prepared to respond to these types of situations that whether we like it or not are becoming more and more prevalent so that we are ready to respond to a broken world. So if you would, church, if you'd open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, please turn in your Bibles over to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 12, the first part of verse 12. And so the scriptures read in Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, and giving joyful thanks to the Father... Church, we need to understand that the Father is due all of our thanks. Even in the face of evil times like today, even in the face of wicked generations, the Father is still due all thanksgiving and praise that we can muster. Especially within the context of the Colossians, of the Colossians' response to the gospel and their submission to the Spirit's work in their life. Their submission to the Spirit and their response to the gospel of Christ has produced great faith, exceeding love, and a hope of hope. Church, they are no longer looking at what Rome says or Rome does. They're no longer looking at what the world claims to be and claims to offer. They're no longer looking at mute statues and idols like our brothers and sisters in Mexico have to deal with in a culture that looks to them. Rather, they are looking to the promises that we have in faith through Christ Jesus. They're looking forward to one day being like Him. As Paul will say in 1 Thessalonians, to having a body like Him, a glorified body like Christ. They're not looking at the world. And understand, church, I had this conversation just recently, we are exceptionally privileged in the United States. Exceptionally privileged. We abs- I- I- and this isn't about race or identity or anything like that. Understand, if you are a citizen of the United States of America, you have exceptional privilege. What I mean by that is this. You, you can buy into, you can afford to buy into the delusion that this life is anything but suffering. Church, we need to understand that the normal for the majority world, for the rest of all the people on our planet, all six and a half, six point seven, seven point three billion of them, for the vast majority of people on this planet, this life is one of suffering. It is only here in the United States and in certain Western countries in Europe that we can afford to pay for a delusion of safety. 
and a figment of happiness. But that delusion of safety and figment of happiness does not come from God. Rather, it comes from us buying into the things of this world, pursuing our own pleasures. And now we live in such a time that the pursuit of those pleasures turn and destroy us. Paul is looking at these Christians in Colossae and he's giving joyful thanks to the Father because rather than buying in to the hopelessness of Rome, the feudal promises that a Roman emperor and fake gods make, rather than buying into that, they have put all of their hope on Christ and it shows. It shows through their faith and it shows through their love. And in, verse, in the rest of verse 12, he says, And giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Not only has God produced the fruit of the gospel in this church's life, but take a step back and understand what the gospel message really is. That we don't have to that this life of suffering is not the end. That this life of suffering is not where God leaves us. That God does not see us in wickedness. He does not see us in our sin. He does not see us as fallen and say, well, I'm done with them. I'm done. I don't want anything to do with them. I don't want anything to do with their wickedness. I don't want anything to do with their sin. If they want to prostrate themselves before idols, if they want to make their lust their God, so be it. I'll leave them to it. Paul gives great thanks to the Father because he saw us. He saw us, church, at our very worst moment. You know what I'm talking about. Each and every one of you in here, I I can almost guarantee it, will have some moment in your life where you know this is your worst. This is the worst thing you've ever done. It's probably the worst thing you ever will do. And God sees you in that moment. And instead of cursing you, instead of being done with you, He reaches out His hand to you. Because that's what the gospel is. Understand, church, that the gospel is Christ is reigning. That because Christ has died, because he has given up his life, because he has shed his blood, you now have the opportunity to rise with him. To go farther than you could have ever gone on your own. To ascend and sit on the throne with Jesus. A place where none of us deserve to be. You say, Cole, what about that worst moment in my life? Despite that, God has made his love known to us in that he redeemed us while we were enemies. It is this inheritance that the Colossian church looks forward to. It is this inheritance in his holy people in the kingdom of light that Paul gives great thanks because he has qualified us. Church, understand there is nothing that you can do. We've talked a lot about the response to the gospel that we should have, the fruit that the gospel should bear in our lives, the faith that it should bear, the love that it should bear, the hope that we should have. All of these things that are very important, but understand, church, none of them make you worthy of the gift that he has given. None of them make us worthy of what he has given us. None of it could. There's nothing that could. You could walk into this auditorium every single Sunday morning for the rest of your life, but if you you don't have love, if you don't have faith, none of it matters. Church, we must trust in what Jesus has done for us. We must trust in His work on the cross. And it is only through that trust and the dedication that we live towards others that we have any hope Everything else is a fool's errand. And so we give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And in verse 13, he tells us, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. I was uh, talking this over with a friend. As you know, as many of you know, I, I 
haven't been a Christian for very long. And this friend that I was talking, talking this issue over with was a Satanist. And one of the interesting things he asked me after I'd become a Christian, he said, well, what, what if you've sold your soul to the devil? I mean, it's a, it's a popular Hollywood thing, right? The Faustian deal. We sign, a, we sign a deal with the devil. We get something out of it. The devil gets our soul. And it, it's something that Hollywood has spoken up. They build up quite a bit. Church, understand that you can't sell to the devil what he already owns. It doesn't work that way. Look at this verse. Read what this verse really says. Church, understand that without the gospel, without the blood of Christ, without obedience to it, without faithfully following, we're in a kingdom of darkness. The enemy already reigns over us. Think about the world for a second. The things not only going on in our culture, but all over the planet. What makes more sense to you? That a bunch of people haven't signed a contract yet to sell their souls? Or there's a whole lot of people who are already owned by the devil and they just don't know it? We need to understand what this gospel produces, church. It is a rescue. A rescue of those who are damned. A rescue of those from the enslavement of sin and death. That's what this gospel is all about, church. This gospel isn't about helping you live your best life. This gospel isn't about Jesus becoming your best friend. This gospel isn't about you getting all the things that you ever wanted in life. This gospel is about you are dead. You were beaten and bloody on the side of the road. And nobody cared. Nobody was coming for you. And then Jesus, at great risk to himself, with great sacrifice, came and picked you up off the side of the road. And he bandaged you up. And he got his blood, rather, he got our blood all over him. And yet he picks us up, and he cleans us up, and he bears us, and he brings us out of the worst place we have ever been. You know how bad this place is, church? I'll, I'll explain it to you. This place is the world, and sin is, is heroin. Have you ever watched a heroin addict? Have you ever watched an alcoholic as they're struggling to breathe and dying reach for another bottle? I have. I've been there. I've seen it. I've watched the heroin addict swing at me because I'm giving him medication that's going to save him. That's what sin is, church. That's what sin does. It brings us in, like James says. It entices us along. This is what you really want. Think of Eve in the garden. When she saw that the fruit was good, what did God say? This fruit's going to kill you. What did, Eve, what did the enemy say? Oh, surely not. Poo poo. And Eve looked at that fruit and she desired it. And she wanted it. And so she took. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, even then, church, she would have died. Church, we must understand what this gospel, what our Lord's gospel is really all about. This mother, whose Reddit post I read this beginning before my voice box decided to go away. Um, this mother, horrible thing she has done to her son. She's butchered him. She's cut him up. She calls him now daughter. These are horrible things. But understand that the mother is a victim too. And we may not want to see that. We may not want to hear that. We may righteously want to be angry. But church, we must be angry at the appropriate thing. Because church, very soon, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, this story will not be uncommon. This is where our culture is going. This is where our society is going. And in some states, they want to call CPS on you if you disagree with this ideology. In some states, you're the unfit parent if you want to protect your child from this ridiculousness, from this horror. So understand, church, 
where this world is headed and just how many broken people sin is going to hurt. And church, if we're not prepared to look at this stuff now, in five years we won't be ready for the flood of victims, for the flood of refugees. Hale pointed out in the Lord's Supper this morning that when we raise that cup, that we're saying we're going to serve Him. It's not about us. It's not about what we want. Church, understand that God puts you here in this place today, in this time, to confront this wickedness. There are lots of other places, church. The problems for the ch- that the church faces in China are different than the problems we face here. The problems in Mexico are different than the problems we face here. The problems in Africa are different than the problems we face here. This is our fight, church. This is our culture. Congratulations. I don't know if you knew this or not, but you're God's commandos. And he wants you to kick in the door and run into the kingdom of darkness and snatch from the enemy those who are being destroyed. That's your job. That's your mission. Our brothers and sisters, our brothers like Dan Spath and our, our elders like Dan Spath and James Coburn and Dan Marshall are here to help us do that. I am here to help us do that to help remind us, church, of what our mission in this world ought to be. It's not about making money. It's not why God has you here. It's not about living in the revelry of the world. That is not why God has us here. God has us here, church, to proclaim His gospel, to proclaim His glory, and to remind a lost and dying nation that this is not the end, that there is, in fact, a judge and that there is hope. And that that judge sits on a throne of mercy and loves us all dearly and wants us to surrender to him. Not just some of us, not just part of us, but everything we have. Church, he has done everything necessary to move us into the kingdom of his son and it is in his son that we have redemption that we are redeemed the the word redeemed it literally means to buy back church understand if you have not obeyed the gospel if you've not surrendered to him the enemy isn't waiting for you to contact him he's not waiting for you to make a phone call he's not waiting for you to go to the crossroads and make a Faustian deal you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're already his. You already belong to him. But through Christ's blood, we don't have to stay enslaved to sin. We don't have to stay enslaved to death because through Christ we have been redeemed. We have received, we've been bought back. We have received the forgiveness of sins. Church, the fruit of the gospel is twofold. It is God's righteousness. It is his redemption. It is sanctification. Ultimately, church, it is the free gift of salvation from enslavement to sin and death. His gospel also works in us, working in us to produce great faith and sacrificial love and earnest hope. The fruit that the gospel should bear in your lives. Because God has redeemed us, we should love one another. We should seek to serve one another. We should hold on to Him with everything we have. We should look forward to the day where that deposit, that down payment, brings us back to Him. And we fully are known by God. It is this hope, church, this redemption, this forgiveness, this sanctification, that all of these things that God gives us, it is this hope our world needs to hear. 
desperately needs to hear. Church, understand that we reap what we sow. In the next five to 10 to 15 years, our society is going to be overwhelmed with broken, deformed, and emasculated people. Let that sink in. These will be people that will have been betrayed by their families and by our own government. Don't let your name be added to the list of people who turned their back on these wounded, hurt souls. Resolve yourself today, church. Because if you don't resolve yourself today, when it gets hot, when it gets heavy, when the day springs on you like a trap, you won't be prepared. So resolve yourself today to meet these lies, to meet this falsehood, to meet this travesty with the truth of the gospel. Not that God hates the, those who have fallen victim to sin and death, but rather that God loves them. And God is willing to bring you back. He's willing to redeem you. He's willing to forgive you if you but give yourself up to him. It is this truth that our culture needs now more than ever, that our world desperately needs to hear. So going forward, church, understand. There's an old adage. It says, uh, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. But if you watch the news, you're misinformed. Right, And we've talked a lot about the fear that our media is selling at a discount. Understand, church, resolve yourself to now be informed. To know what is going on in the world. But not just what's going on in the world, church. Resolve yourself to know what's in this book. <coughs> resolve yourself to know what's in the Word of God and how we must respond to a lost and dying world. Because you may be the only hope, the only light anyone ever sees. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, if you're ready to give up your life and follow Christ, if you're ready to be redeemed, I'm going to be right back there in the prayer room. We have elders standing up in the back. If you need to come, I ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.